So my name is Brian Eady. I'm the Professor for Infrastructure Management at the ETH. Um, and I will be giving the first part of uh, our presentation uh, on the topic, a process to assess infrastructure related risks due to natural hazards with stress tests. Um, part two will be done by my colleague um, from PSCT, uh, Peter van Gelder. To start with, um, I just want to uh, clarify or situate this work a bit. Um, infrastructure managers, as Brian Bell uh, pointed out, uh, have to execute interventions um, in many different situations, but basically with the goal to ensure that people are getting an adequate level of service. Um, part of that is to plan and execute risk-reducing interventions. Um, in our work, uh, we've proposed a high-level process uh, that can be used by all infrastructure managers. Um, in all different situations. Uh, we had to back up to a very high level uh, to be able to do this. That is because, sorry, <laughs> that is because um, all infrastructure managers are, or infrastructure managers are confronted with very unique situations with respect to the infrastructure that they are looking at, um, the types of hazards um, that they're looking at, um, what expertise they have at disposition and how much time um, they have to be able to do risk analysis. Um, Eugene showed it in one of his graphs, um, the very high level process uh, that we propose is shown here on the right hand side. Um, it's one um, where some of the words are most likely familiar to you, um, but it's one that we're proposing that can be used uh, in a way that encourages um, information to be collected at a, a right level, uh, so you're not trying to collect too much information at the wrong period of time and that you can escalate this in a situation uh, to, so that you uh, collect more information if you need it. Um, the process that we're proposing is one that is applicable for the wide range of situations for all types of infrastructures, types of hazards, with expertise and time available, and also with different amounts of computer support. I want to go through now each one of these tasks. The first one is setting up the risk assessment, um, where you actually then require the people who are going to do it um, to think through what, it actually, what actually needs to be checked in order for you to say that you have an acceptable level of risk or not. And then if you don't, to decide whether or not you're going to execute interventions to uh, reduce your level of risk. Um, or in other words, you need to determine your stress tests. Um, what you do at this stage affects everything else that comes in the risk assessment process. It affects um, how you're going to try to represent your system, what you're going to model, um, in what way you're going to do it, and who you're going to have involved in the process. It is a task where you're going to find it's particularly complex because you might have lots of experts in the room that recognize that risk is perhaps an issue, but you're going to have uh, a lot of different opinions about how to go at it and what is actually important. Once you do define which stress tests you want to conduct, you have to go ahead and determine your approach. How is it that you want to go about trying to evaluate whether or not you passed the stress tests? That involves thinking through if you're going to use a qualitative approach, a semi-quantitative or a quantitative, or if you're going to use different approaches for different levels of detail, depending on if you need to. You need to give then serious thought about who is it that's going to be involved, at what point in the process. Is it going to be uh, civil engineers? Is it going to be environmental engineers? Is it going to be climate uh, scientists? Or is it going to be stakeholders that are actually using the network, or all of them? You also need to decide how much computer support you're going to need. Um, Maybe in a first go through, you don't have any computer support at all, and it's a discussion among experts. But then if you need lots of detail, you're going to need an awful lot of computer support as well. In this task, you also have to spend effort to figure out how you're going to aggregate the risks that you calculate or estimate um, so that you can show whether or not you pass the stress test. The second task our third task, sorry, the task following the term and approach task, is to define your system representation. How is it specifically now that you want to model the real world? Um, you have to do this 
taking in consideration your spatial and temporal boundaries. And when I mention system here, I don't just mean the infrastructure that you're looking at. You have to decide what part of the natural environment it is you want to model and in what way. So if you're looking at flooding, that also means looking at how much rain might fall, in what areas, uh, how much water is going to become or enter into the rivers that is going to come in contact with your bridges. You have to decide that you do want to model bridges uh, and their impact with respect to the water. And then you also need to decide on what type of human behavior is it that you want to model. Is it traffic patterns on the road network, for example, if they are flooded? But it is also, in what depth do you want to go into detail with respect to your restoration sequences that you want to execute if your network is found in a certain condition state after an extreme event like a flood? At this point, you also take into consideration any correlations that you have between events, like um, that lead to cascading events. So if a flood actually, or a heavy rainfall, not only cre creates flooding, but also triggers uh, landslides because the water in the mountains is saturated. If we look into um, that box, um, system representation, we have five subtasks, what I want to go through uh, in a little bit more detail. The first is the definition of boundaries. Um, this is somehow intuitive, but when you get into the details of conducting the risk assessment, you find it's a bit more complicated than that. It's more complicated because the spatial boundaries that you have to define vary depending on what you're looking at, but you need to be clear about this. You need to be clear that um, if you're looking at rainfall in an area, you might be interested in the whole catchment area, but um, it doesn't mean that every bit of infrastructure in the catchment area is of interest. So you need a spatial boundary around the infrastructure that you're looking at. And if the infrastructure goes down, you have to define the boundaries, the spatial boundaries, to cover where the traffic's flowing that you want to take into consideration. This is also the same thing with respect to the temporal boundaries. Um, the rain falls in a certain period of time. Um, the infrastructure uh, then behaves in a certain period of time, and it takes you a certain amount of time to restore it. So you also have to be clear of how, what are the periods of time that you're, you're looking at. Um, the traffic consequences of collapsed bridges in a, in a road network can take two, three, four, five, or six years or more uh, to repair. When you have the boundaries, and this is quite an iterative process, but when you finally have your boundaries uh, defined, the next thing that has to be defined for certain are the events that you want to look at. Um, it's important to be clear on this uh, because if you don't, if you miss some of the events that you actually care about, um, they're not going to be in your risk analysis, and that might lead you to an underestimate or an overestimate of how much risk is uh, that you have, which can affect your decision making of what you need to do. Um, you can define or classify events in all different kinds of ways. Um, what we're proposing in the InfoRisk project is that you look at them, uh, as I've shown here in this table, with a source event. So from the modeling perspective, this is an event that just simply happens uh, with a certain probability, and like rainfall. And if that happens, uh, it will lead to a hazard event, which is um, the event that tells you how your infrastructure is going to be affected. That will lead to an infrastructure event, which will be the different states your infrastructure might be in after they're exposed to the hazard. Um, this will lead you to a network use event, which will tell you what this means with respect to your infrastructure. If you need to shut down certain uh, travel lanes or, uh, or reduce speeds on them, for example. And then in the end, you will have your societal events or what does this mean with respect to how traffic patterns are actually changing on the network? And um, how is it that you're actually going to fix the infrastructure if it does fail? Many people make the assumption that if a bridge fails, uh, they know exactly how much it's going to cost. This is categorically not the case for network infrastructure, because if multiple things go down at the same time, it takes a lot of effort and different restoration sequences to bring things back online, and this uh, causes chaos with the amount of uh, costs you're actually going to have. And so we have those grouped under societal events. The societal events are the only events in this case that you actually put a monetary value to um, so that you can quantify risk. Everything else leads up to it. Once the events are defined, you need to be clear about how they're strung together in the scenarios that you want to uh, investigate in more detail. You need to link them together. I don't know if I, if that comes up there. 
from the source event to the hazard event to the infrastructure event to the network use event to the societal event, which you then put the value on. This involves determining the intensity measures um, that you are going to want to use to tell you if a certain event is triggered or not. For example, right here, I have rainfall. So if rainfall in a certain area is above A, that means that I'm going to have a hazard event of a certain level for certain pieces of infrastructure. Obviously, the figure that I show here is about the simplest event tree I could possibly do. Um, in many cases, you wouldn't go about developing the event tree, but you need to have it in the back of the mind when you're constructing all of your models uh, that one event is leading to your other events. It's important at this stage, or I think it's important at this stage, to not specifically try to estimate probability of occurrence or the values of the consequences, but to get agreement from the people in your group uh, of what scenarios uh, are actually important, and then in, the in a, uh, a next step, figure out what the values of these actually are going to be. When the scenarios are, are determined, and there's agreement on that, the next step is to figure out what the relationships are going to be to allow you to predict uh, what's going to happen. Um, for example, uh, if you know that a rainfall of a certain of, uh, intensity is of interest to you, um, that's great, you can predict that, it can be treated as a source event. Um, and then you have a hazard event of having so much water com coming in contact with the bridge that will lead to overflowing of the bridge and knocking it down, perhaps. But there's a lot of aspects in there to take you from the rainfall uh, to the loading of the bridge. And you need to know things here in the relationship, like, well, if rain falls, how much of it's going to seep into the ground and how much is going to evaporate and how much of it is going to be held into re retention ponds, for example. I'm only offering that as an example to go here from a rainfall event uh, to how much water is actually going to be in the river at certain areas. In this task, uh, you need to define what those relationships are at least to a point where you can construct the models that you want to have to allow you to estimate risk. Um, this could involve, in some cases, testing of certain parts of infrastructure to see if they behave in certain ways. Um, it could involve also collecting data to allow you to better estimate, for example, how much rain might fall in a certain area or how much rain leads to how much water in the river. Um, so when you have the relationships defined, you still have to come up with what model it is that you want to use. Um, and there is a huge amount of models, a huge number of models out there at your disposition to do this. In some cases, you might want to use very simple models, like a one-dimensional vulnerability curve, or you might want to uh, um, use things that are more complex, like multi-dimensional vulnerability curves. Um, in some cases, they were developed also in our InfraRisk project uh, by Dina, Dahlia, and her colleagues at UCL. Um, in developing the models, uh, and this is connected a bit with the temporal boundaries, you have to, if you want to, uh, not forget that these things are all very dynamic. Um, I have here illustrated uh, things if for a rainfall situation where we have precipitation, which obviously changes over a whole area in different times, uh, over a period of uh, investigated period of time, you have the runoff, which changes because in the beginning a lot of water can seep into the uh, soil, but after a while it can't. This has an impact on how much water is going to be in the river in every uh, hour over an investigated time period. What this means with respect to flooding of different road sections, how this affects road capacity, and how the road capacity uh, affects uh, travel time on the network, uh, which changes constantly. So when defining the models, you have to make sure that you think about whether or not you want to have these temporal changes over the year investigated period. Or, of course, if you want to do things uh, quicker, you can still make a static representation instead of pretending that everything's not going to change. But this is a decision that you need to consciously make and not have it find just uh, happen. When you have all of those things together, um, you are in the situation to estimate risk um, so that you can tell whether or not your stress tests are passed or not passed. Um, and there you have all kinds of indicators that you can actually develop. Obviously, you can estimate something like a total amount of risk, which you're including additional travel time, you're including amounts of fatalities, um, uh, injuries, um, reconstruction costs, and so on. But you can also, that one number is often not enough to make a decision if you have the acceptable level of risk or not, but you can look into it in a lot more detail. And for here, for example, I have a, a return period 
versus how much time it takes you to restore the network to a full capacity. And if you take one return period, you can see that there's an awful lot of variation of that, uh, of what might actually happen when you run the simulations. Um, that variability, uh, or the certainty with respect to your estimations of probabilities of occurrence and consequences related to each scenario should be taken into consideration. Um, Perhaps, uh, at least in the first go, uh, you can't do that necessarily perfectly quantitatively, but you can run sensitivity analysis uh, where you zoom in on certain values of certain parameters um, and indicators of where you might have issues are um, the divergence of opinions of the experts that you have in your group, the availability of the data that you might have, um, and your certainty of whether or not the models you're using are very good or not very good. Um, in this estimate risk task, uh, you can also generate wonderful uh, graphs that give you a bit of a representation of where things might be going wrong in regions. Here we have one where you can see where flooding might actually happen uh, during a 1 in 500 year event. You can also do this uh, for the traffic flow, where you think there's going to be changes in traffic flow of certain levels, which give you an idea of where you might want to uh, intervene to do something about it. You can also group together quite easily the infrastructure that might be affected uh, due to uh, extreme events, uh, as we've done here with 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5 regions, which give you an idea if you want to uh, concent concentrate your funding on uh, preventative measures, which areas you might want to look at. Coupled with that, so that tells you where things might be, you can also determine uh, how much the reconstruction costs might be for those areas in certain situations. In this case, uh, we have construction costs plotted against the number of uh, pieces of infrastructure or elements in the certain area that might need repairing. And uh, you can see quite clearly that uh, area four uh, has the most consequences in terms of reconstruction costs. Um, once, the est once you've estimated the risk, you probably could quantitatively say whether or not your uh, risk assessment is passed or not, uh, or the stress tests are passed or not but we don't advise you to do it right away. Um, we have an evaluate risk task. In the evaluate risk task, uh, we have two main uh, activities. One is uh, we want um, the stakeholders themselves uh, to take a look at the results and see how they perceive whether or not this is good or not. The people living in area four, for example, might be totally irate, and even though the total level of risk is okay, they still want something done about it. But the second part is that obviously we're built in conducting risk assessments, we're constructing models of systems and none of these are perfect. So even with best intentions at the beginning, everyone involved needs to take a step back from it in the end and evaluate whether or not the system has been evaluated appropriately or appropriately to the point that you can actually make the decision to do an intervention or not to do an intervention or execute multiple interventions or to do nothing. The end of this task, um, you end up with two basic things. One, the risk assessment has been performed satisfactorily, and you have either failed it or not. And if you failed it, you will go on to plan interventions, and if you haven't, you will, don't have to do anything. But the other, the second one, is that you're actually going to say, well, actually it hasn't been done satisfactorily. It doesn't mean the people doing the analysis haven't done it in a good way, but you need to have more information before you can make the, your decision. And in that case, you need to go back up and do look at um, the parts of the system that you want to analyze in more detail. That could be the whole system, uh, or it could just be parts of the system. Here, though, it's important to emphasize that you should not be cherry-picking um, uh, the parts of your system where you think that if you looked at it in more detail that you'll pass the stress test. The goal is never to pass the stress test. It is to find out whether or not your infrastructure uh, will behave in a way that you want so that you have an acceptable level of risk. So there, we recommend that you actually uh, give an overview of the amount of uncertainty you have related to the different parts of your system, and if you have budget constraints, figure out which are the easiest ways that you can reduce this amount of certainty so you can be clear on whether or not you have to do any interventions to reduce the amount of risk that you have that is related to your infrastructure due to natural hazards. Good. That is a quick overview at a high level of the process that we're proposing in uh, InfraRisk to be used to assess 
the risk related to infrastructure networks uh, due to natural hazards with stress tests. Um, it is purposely at the very high level so that it can be used by all infrastructure managers in a wide range, I hesitate to say all, but a wide range of situations. So people have all different kinds of infrastructure, all kinds of different hazards are important, there are different expertise, different time, there's totally different levels of detail, uh, detailed information available, and people have totally different ranges of the amount of uh, computer support at their disposition. And hopefully that is something that will also cover a lot of the things that Brian Bell showed in the earlier presentation. Um, for more information and for an example that we used actually to generate these graphs, you can look in Deliverable 4.2 if you would like to, but coming up later today, we have more information on the two uh, European case studies that we did in Italy and Croatia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Uh, the second part of this uh, presentation will be made by Peter van Gelder from PSCT in the Netherlands. Okay. Welcome, Peter. The floor is yours. Everybody, is this working? Oh, yeah, first here, sorry. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. I just noticed, in fact, that I'm the first non native English speaker uh, this morning after having all those native English speakers. So uh, please bear with uh, my accent, strong Dutch accent, unfortunately. Uh, today I will tell a bit about the, the fundamentals or maybe the, the essence of a stress test. And a lot of these ideas were, in fact, developed by the second co-author of this work, uh, Noël van Erp. Um, the, the layout of my talk is as follows. First, I will present some concepts of the stress testing methodology. And then I will um, come with a mathematical definition of stress tests. And um, then I will present the framework of a stress test uh, in which I show a number of highlights. And in fact, I'm, I have to move to <coughs> a different presentation because this is the old version. Um, where can I find it? So in, in, the, in the final framework of the stress test methodology, we have a number of steps, six steps in total. Uh, and in this presentation, I will zoom in on three interesting uh, st steps. One of them is related um, to the transition from a uh, hazard map to a probability map. Uh, and there we use some novel algorithms um, then the, the, the second step is um, related to uh, a decision protocol, and that's a framework where we compare different outcome probability distributions with each other. Okay, let me first uh, present the, the stress testing concept, which we in fact borrowed from the financial industry, where it is said that you have to investigate the response of your system given some adverse scenario. Uh, in the financial industry, typically uh, things like an unemployment rate increases to 20% or the default of a country. In our infrastructural networks, our adverse scenarios are natural hazards, uh, floods, earthquakes, and landslides. Um, okay, the outcome of the stress test, we have heard it already uh, a few times this morning should enable us to inform infrastructural decision makers uh, 
uh, where to improve the system. So how to reduce the risk by which interventions at which places in the system. Mathematically, our stress test is defined as a uh, probability distribution uh, of the outcomes O uh, given a stress scenario and given a, um, a status quo, A0. Um, we use here a subscript I to indicate that there are a number of uh, outcome metrics if we has, if we has, as we have seen before. Uh, typically, we, in infrastructures, we talk about delay in travel time, uh, repair costs, or loss, or loss of connectivity. Um, a number of different outcome metrics can be uh, uh, distinguished. Um, a, pr uh, a priori, um, we do the stress test at the situation as it is now. So, so therefore, we have as a condition an A0. Later on, we are going to replace those A0s by A1, A2, so we will investigate the influence of different actions. So the, our stress test, stress test definition is basically um, an, a, de a definition which leads to a probability uh, distribution function of the outcomes conditionalized on a given stress scenario, i.e. it's a conditional outcome distribution. And, and this is, in fact, in contrast to a, a risk definition, which is an unconditional outcome distribution, where you consider all possible uh, natural hazards. In the stress test, you just focused on one given natural hazard. Uh, the well-known example of uh, a, a missed stress test opportunity is the Fukushima disaster, uh, where um, an extreme earthquake occurred, which had, has never been observed before with a magnitude 9. But the resulting tsunami, uh, which was observed, had happened already 14 times over the past 500 years. Um, so the, the, the wave run-up was more than 10 meters, whereas the, the, the flood defenses uh, designed to protect the nuclear power plant against tsunami was only 5.7 meters. So had the, the, the civil engineers applied a stress test on the adverse scenario of a tsunami with a run-up of more than 10 meters, maybe this accident wouldn't have happened. Good. Our uh, framework consists of basically of six steps. The first step is the generation of a natural hazard stress scenario. Second step then is that from given that scenario we produce a spatial hazard map. Given the spa and for that we use uh, a physical model. I will show the physical model which we have used to generate the, the spatial hazards for flooding. Uh, the colleagues from CSIC used the physics to produce spatial hazard maps for earthquakes. Given the spatial hazard map we calculate a probability map uh, showing the probabilities of the of failure or the, the probabilities of certain damage states of the components within the system via conditional fragility curves which were uh, produced by our colleagues from UCL. Given the probability map, a certain damage state scenarios um, can be uh, derived. And for that, we needed our smart, smart algorithms. The reason for that is the curse of dimensionality, because networks typically consist of large numbers of components with uh, uh, multiple damage states, so the computation time increases exponentially. Uh, we have applied three types of algorithms, Monte Carlo sampling, uh, nested sampling, and a probabilistic sort algorithm. And the last step then, involves the conversion of the damage state scenario to an uh, outcome metric, the estimation of an outcome met metric, which is basically uh, substitution. And the, the very last step is to, to compare the different outcome metrics with each other and to prioritize the outcome metrics. And for that, we developed a novel uh, decision uh, protocol. Good. Step one then involves the selection of stress scenarios. Uh, 
which is basically done by expert judgment in Delphi panels uh, with a large number of uh, experts. And we can distinguish four types of methodologies. One of them is based on using historical scenarios, employing shocks that occurred in the past. But uh, apart from that, we can also come up with scenarios with no historical precedent. Uh, so we are going to do some kind of statistical extrapolation of the observations from the past. I will uh, zoom in on some examples in a moment, uh, which is also uh, highlighted here in bullet point three. Uh, we have to investigate with our stress scenario the tails of the return distributions. And the last methodology is that you can also look at the the maximum probable loss or the, the largest loss to the system under consideration. Uh, our colleagues from Sweden and the Netherlands, uh, Richie and Prag, uh, developed some very interesting structured brainstorming uh, techniques and sessions to uh, elicit the stress scenarios in a structured way. And here you can now see the example of a, a stress scenario which has been generated for the Croatian case study. And the colleagues from ROD will zoom in on that later on. But basically it uh, involves the extrapolation of the actual observations given here by the, the blue dots, uh, which are the annual maxima uh, river discharges of one of the main rivers in Croatia in cubic meters per second where on the vertical axis you can see the exceedance probabilities per year. And um, our stress scenario then comes down to uh, identifying the one in T years uh, flood hazard. First of all, the intensity level in cubic meters per second. So for instance, for a one in thousand years event, the intensity level would be up to 1,200 cubic meters per second. And that's then the mean estimate. In our stress, scenario, in our stress framework, we also uh, stressed the essence that you need a, 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 worst, a best case scenario, in, in this case a 2.5% lower bound, as well as an, uh, best, uh, a worst case scenario, a 97.5% upper bound. So in total, three values are needed in order to uh, conduct the stress test uh, appropriately. But not only intensity is important for uh, flood stress scenarios, uh, as well as important is the duration of the flood. Also there, we used uh, a statistical extrapolation technique where you just uh, check you know, the, the past, how often uh, from the past 20 or 30 years, how long did the, the, the flood events take in days? Uh, where you can see that the longest flood here almost took 20 days. If you now extrapolate to a thousand year level, you can come up with the durations of a uh, really adverse scenario. So combining the intensity as well as the duration will then result in the hydrographs. Uh, which are the discharges in cubic meters per second as a function of the day number for a 200 years event, a 500 years event, and a 1,000 years event, where we, we show the worst case, best case, and mean scenarios. So in total, nine curves. And the green circles here indicate the, the actual observations from past events. Okay, but that's then step one, that's the stress scenario. The stress scenario has to be uh, mapped into a uh, spatial hazard map showing the propagation of a flood or an earthquake uh, downstream uh, as a function of time and space. And the blue curve here indicates the, the actual stress scenario at T is zero. Um, uh, 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 in fact, basically the hydrograph as presented on the pre previous slide. And by using a linear hydrodynamic model, we could propagate that flood downstream uh, as a function of day, uh, day numbers, day one, day two, and day five, show how the, the flood dampens if it goes downstream, but can still cause damage to the infrastructure along the, the riverbed further downstream. <coughs> 
Good. This spatial hazard map now has to be converted to a probability map, where the probability map shows the, the probabilities of a certain damage state uh, at the location x, y at the time t. And the, the problem for infrastructural systems is that we have our probability maps are usually quite large. Large. This is now an image of a simple toy example where you have only five components in your system. But already, if you would investigate here as an outcome metric the loss of connectivity, uh, that you are unable to reach home uh, to work, for instance, then the number of cut sets become very large. Uh, if you look at the number of minimum cut sets, that's still uh, reasonable, there are only three minimum cut sets here. What really complicates things here is the dependency of the components in your system. Because the failure of a component one is dependent on the failure of a component two, very likely. Because the common cause is usually uh, a big flood. If the big flood would damage component one, bridge one, it will very probably also damage bridge two maybe not that much bridge five. And so the, the spatial dependency is something which we had to incorporate in our stress test framework as, as accurate as possible. So here you can see an example of a probability map showing the probabilities of a system of 121 components arranged in an 11 by 11 grid uh, caused by the, the spatial flood hazard. Um, if you would assume only two damage states per component, uh, so a DS0 and a DS1, no damage or full damage, collapse, then the total damaged state space is already 2 times 6 times 10 to the power 36. That's 2 to the power 121. And that's impossible to compute uh, in a, in a, in a, even in a very fast computer in a linear way, you need some clever algorithms to, to deal with this complex, with this exponential increase in uh, computation time. And for that we looked into a number of smart algorithms and one of them we developed ourselves, that's the, the probabilistic sort algorithm, PSA where we are sorting our uh, damage state vectors. So if we would start with 10 to the power 36 damage state vectors, it appeared that only 65,000 damage state vectors is enough to investigate, uh, even to end up with a probability coverage of 1.0. So the results by this smart algorithm are almost identical to the results which you would obtain if you would navigate the full damage state space. And it's basically um, achieved by ordering your probability distribution from small to large, which basically are four steps uh, and comes down to projecting your side view of the joint probability distributions to the vertical axis and then cutting off your columns at a, a certain threshold value. The details are uh, described in our deliverable uh, 6.2. Okay, then uh, we have again a trivial step within our stress test framework, which is basically to uh, substitute the damage state scenarios into our outcome metric. So given those 65,000 of uh, damage state scenarios, we can estimate our outcome metric in this way, uh, or we can present it in this way, horizontally we put the uh, uh, outcome metric, in this case repair costs, and vertically we put our, the frequency, the probability of occurrence. So that's not a difficult step, but the, difficult, the last step in the stress test framework is again difficult because now we have to make decisions of the outcomes and we should also decide which kind of outcome is acceptable to our uh, infrastructural manager. And um, the, the, the traditional technique there is to use 
cost-benefit analyses. We are comparing the costs of the intervention in the system versus the benefits it, cr it creates, which is in fact a risk reduction which is achieved by the intervention. And as soon as the cost-benefit ratio then ex exceeds one, then we'll say, okay, now it's wise to apply that intervention. Um, in, in our uh, decision protocol, we use, more, we use more a prioritization of measures, and, and for that we adopted a full Bayesian decision framework. Let's compare two conditionalized outcome probability distributions. Um, distribution one, given a decision one, a decision to, uh, to apply a certain intervention in the system, versus an outcome probability distribution given a decision two. If you would only base it now on expected values, you could make that decision very easily. Just take the, the one with the, the lowest uh, outcomes. But you also have to incorporate the uncertainties in the outcomes. Eh? You should say something about the lower bounds and the upper bounds. And in our decision protocol, we looked at the, tr the trade-offs between the lower and the upper bound gains. Where the lower bound gain is given here by the green shaded area, and the upper bound gain is uh, given by the red shaded area. And because the green area uh, favors the red area, we can say now we, let's choose decision D2. Uh, or equivalently, we choose D2 because the difference in lower bounds is larger than the difference in upper bounds. Or equivalently, if we take an upper bound to the other side, the summation of the lower and upper bound of one decision exceeds the summation of the lower bound and upper bound of the other decision. So the comparison of bounds then may be simplified into a comparison of a single measure. So finally, our decision protocol says that you should look at the summation of lower bound, expected value and upper bound, and choose that decision which ma maximizes the summation of those three terms instead of only maximizing the uh, expected values. So that brings me to the concluding remarks, um, which is in fact that, um, our, that we have presented the stress test framework, which is more or less a special instance of a risk framework, uh, where the difference is that we are uh, conditionalizing on one adverse scenario instead of marginalizing over all possible stress scenarios. And, well, m maybe you will think that's a, a, a very trivial approach. It's uh, simple enough on the conceptual side, but on the practical side, however, when we want to implement this framework, so when we want to propagate a stress scenario through the uh, infrastructural network with so many components and so many dependencies, then things become quickly non-trivial. And for in that case, you need uh, clever algorithms, uh, which we have developed in our work package, uh, and which is also extended by a novel uh, decision protocol to decide on uh, which outcome distribution is now acceptable and which not. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>